start a class here is, uh, as soon as our uh, industrious leader uh, finishes his conversation. No, Bruce, you can stay, Bruce. You can help answer the questions. <laughs> I do need targets. The more targets I have, the more interesting the class gets, right? <laughs> All right, well, welcome to class tonight. This is week number nine. Holy moly, we're almost there. So tonight we will cover safety. Next week we're going to have a review and I'll get you a handout on how to get your FRN and how to get registered for the test and all that good stuff. And then the following week, there will be a VE group here, volunteer examiners uh, from our Laurel testing group. And uh, we will have a test two weeks from tonight. So I encourage everybody to take it. Whether you feel ready or not, take it. Then you kind of get an idea what the test is like. And maybe, if you don't feel you're ready, you may still pass it. Not going to eat. And Laurel is free, so it's a free, te- it's a free, sh- it's a free shot at it. So we encourage you to do that. There are a lot of people that will take that test. They will pass it, and then they'll learn about ham radio. Um, you're ahead of that because we've been learning along the way. So, and you may want to just take your general test right after you pass the test. That's right. If you pass your, if, if you pass your tech class, you can immediately take your general. So what's the difference? You have more bands to talk on. More bands to talk on. Well, but it, what's the difference in tests? Though? It's different material. Oh. Different. Well, well, how would we know? We wouldn't know enough, would we? Uh, depending on the... Dep- depends. Depends. Yeah, depends on the people to buy and take it and pass it. Get their tech and run into the general. Yeah. It all depends what you pick up as you're studying. A lot of the questions are the same thing. And some oh. people so do it all. It's not all of these scores. It's all of Most of them Some of them do. <laughs> We're not talking about that, though, Bruce. <laughs> you talking about me, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, this evening we're going to talk about safety. It is one of the very most important things about ham radio, okay? Safety. We don't want anybody to get hurt, okay? So safety is extremely important. Randy, in his career, he was a safety director, and so safety is a big part of his life, and uh, so I appreciate Randy's input tonight. Okay, so anyway, this evening what we're going to cover, we're going to cover working safely with electricity, AC safety grounding and lightning protection, managing RF current. What's RF? Radio frequency. Radio frequency, yes. We're going to talk about uh, RI interference, okay, radio frequency interference. We're going to talk about radio frequency exposure rules and evaluating your station and how you can reduce exposure to radio frequency and tower and antenna installation safety. So uh, climbing up those antenna towers, uh, you may want to do that sometime in the future, but you want to do it safely. Okay, so you're going to encounter questions about safety on your exam. I guarantee it. Okay, there's going to be some questions on the exam about safety. The safety information that we're going to talk about here is not intended to scare you. It's not intended for that. It's intended to educate. Okay. Um, Radio and electricity are not automatically unsafe. Okay. If electricity was automatically unsafe, we'd all be in a lot of trouble, wouldn't we? But it's not automatically unsafe. It's just unsafe if we work with it incorrectly. Working safely with electricity mostly means avoiding contact with it. And treat electricity with respect. It is very critical that you you do that. Years ago, when I was young and stupid, now I'm old and stupid, but uh, when I was young and stupid, I remember rewiring a light switch in in our bathroom, and I thought I had the power off to that room. Guess what? 
I, I didn't. And I got one heck of a zap. Okay? Luckily, I just got a small zap. But it was enough to teach me a very valuable lesson. Don't touch, don't just assume the power's off. So anymore, if I have to do something with electricity, I'll go down and I'll shut off the main. <laughs> and then I know I am safe, right? There is no electricity going through the house. And luckily, I don't do that very often. I don't, I don't even remember the last time I did work anything with electricity where I had to turn it off. They do make a very inexpensive little tester. They it's do. much bigger than a pencil. You stick it in the outline and it'll tell you. It'll tell you whether it's, it's live or it's not. It's always better to check. Yep. Always half, check. Half a finger burned off when you say anything. Okay. Same thing. You know, not, not paying attention. Not paying attention. And I, I remember I, I used to work out at uh, the Land of Lakes plant in Melrose. And uh, we'd go through safety demonstrations and safety classes all the time. And I was a bean counter, right? I'm sitting in the office all the time. I'm not out in the plant. But I had to go through these just as like all the plant people did. And uh, so it's important. Okay. Okay, electrical injuries. Electrical current through the body can disrupt the electrical function of cells. You don't want electricity flowing through your body. It's not good. It messes up with the cells. Currents of more than a few milliamps can cause involuntary muscle contractions. Milliamp, your muscles are contracting, okay? Large currents can cause burn, can burn the skin and heat tissue. Stephen. And it can only take it only takes like between like one and like four point three amps to stop your heart. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. So it's not that much. So it's not something that you want to, you know, you always want to think when you're dealing with electricity. Okay. So this is just kind of uh, how it if current affects the human body. Below one milliamp, it's generally not per perceptible. Okay, if you have five milliamps, you might get a slight shock, painful, not painful, but disturbing. The average person can let go, okay? Strong involuntary reactions can lead to other injuries. Now, if you get up in six to 25 milliamps for women, you can get a painful shock and loss of muscular control. The freezing current or the can't let go range. Okay, you don't want to do that. 50 to 150 milliampers, extreme pain, respiratory arrest, and severe muscular contractions, and death is possible. 1,000 to 4,300 milliamps, rhythmic pumping action of the heart ceases. Muscular contraction and nerve damage occurred. Death is likely. And uh, 10,000 milliamps, call the undertaker. Lightning. How much electricity is oh God. in a lightning storm? Thousands and thousands of amps. Hundred thousand yeah. volts. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a lot. You don't want to be struck well, by lightning. Being, yeah. you, you hear people <laughs> occasionally surviving a lightning strike. There were four people back in Washington D.C. Did you hear about that? Yeah. A few weeks ago, across from the White House, lightning storm. They were hanging out underneath a tree to get out of the rain. Tree got hit by lightning. All four of them were in serious to critical condition in the hospital. I have no idea how they came out, but three for sure died. Okay. And I don't know the fourth. So it's very uh, not something you want to mess with. Okay. So avoiding electrical hazards. What steps do we follow? Keep one hand in your pocket while probing and testing energized equipment. Why do you think that might be? Any ideas? Randy! <laughs> Electricity wants to ground. And if you have both hands, when it comes in one, it goes all the way through and out the other. Yeah. So if you you got one hidden, you're not going to uh, have any issues with that then, are you? Okay. 
So never bypass a safety interlock during testing unless specifically instructed to do so. I know our equipment out at the plant that we had out in Melrose, they had safety locks. So when maintenance had to go in there, they had to put on that safety lock and they could not touch that equipment until that safety lock was in place. Okay. If they did, it's ground for firing. There's guaranteed firing. Yep. Okay, capacitors in a power supply can store a charge after a charging circuit is turned off, presenting hazardous voltage for a long time. So if you got a power supply and you turn it off, I've got a power supply on my desk at home that I run my radio on. I turn off my radio and then I turn off my power supply and the needle on that power supply keeps staying right over there after it's off. 10 seconds or so, it'll come down. There's a capacitor in that thing and it maintains a current and it holds a charge. Is that why the back of the TV says do not open the back of the TV because you'll get an electrical shock? Bingo. Especially the old under the big tubes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So don't do that. Storage batteries release a lot of energy when shorted. Keep metal objects clear of battery terminals. You don't want to take this and put it across a positive and a negative of a battery. Okay? You don't want to do that. You're going to short that battery out and you're going to get a zap. That's how I used to start my lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yes. How does the answer to the first one I was talking about pens and pens? It avoids a closed circuit. So there's not a closed circuit. If you touch something, let, let's say I'm touching, I'm, I'm touching, let's say this is the electrical thing and I'm touching it here with both hands. The current can run up this arm and right back down into well, it. I mean, if both hands are on it. Uh huh. But so, your hand have to, other hand have to be in your pocket or could it just be in it, it, it could be yeah. anywhere, but, to, but if you think about it, just put it in your pocket and it's, you're safe. It's also far less likely it's going to go through your heart. Yeah. Even if it goes down through your foot, it's going to go down rather than. Then it's, going to, it's not going to come across. Oh. Have you seen pictures of the, uh, the high line, the real high power lines working on those things on the helicopter? No. They, you're right at one hole, of one of those high power lines and no issues because there's no ground. It can't go through oh. it, It's interesting how much. You know, without a ground that you can come in contact with. Yeah. It, that's really cool because you can, um, you're wearing what it's called a, I think it's called like a chem suit or something like that. It's like a white suit. Okay. And you can hold your hands like just a little bit away and you can see the, the electricity. Yep. You can, if you smoke, you can light a cigarette off of it. It's, it's really cool. So I used to, not out of a helicopter, but that's what I used to, to do. Okay, excellent. Thank you. All right. So as we continue, remove unnecessary jewelry from your hands. Okay. If you're working on electricity, take off your jewelry, take off your watches. Don't have that on there. Well, that brings your finger. Yeah, you don't you don't want to have to have them cutting that thing off and along with your finger. Uh, we had a guy at work that came across uh, a high current with his wedding ring, and it took his finger off. He just burned it right off. So. Yeah, so it, it's important. What says unnecessary jewelry? Does that lead us to believe that there is some kind of necessary jewelry that you wouldn't take off? <laughs> just, just say remove all jewelry. <laughs> we could change that to remove all metal. Just, just remove all. <laughs> I don't even want to try to think of what would be necessary. Okay, avoid working alone. Why? So if you're electrocuted, somebody can call the 911. The 911 or the mortuary, right? Okay. And remember that electricity moves a lot faster than you do. I can't move as fast as electricity. Wouldn't even try. I couldn't even do that in my younger years. Okay, AC safety grounding. A home wired to code has properly sized outlets and wiring and a safety ground to help prevent shocks. Most ham stations don't require new wiring. You can use the wiring in your house as long as the following guidelines are followed. Use three wire power, power cords and plugs. 
Make sure all of your equipment has a connection to an AC safety ground. Use ground fault circuit interrupter GFCI circuit breakers or circuit breaker outlets. Verify AC wiring is done properly by using an AC circuit tester. That's what Randy was talking about earlier. Never replace a fuse or a circuit breaker with one of a larger size. Why? Overload. Overload. You're going to let more current go through that system than it's designed for. You don't want that to happen. You're opening yourself up to trouble. So if I, if I blow a fuse, and say a 5-amp fuse, the only one that I... Okay, Howard, how would you fix that? <laughs> you don't stick a penny. You don't yeah. stick a penny in it. That can lead to a house fire, absolutely. So if I blow a 5 amp fuse and I put a 25 amp in, I'm opening myself up to risk of a fire, right? So I'm going to run a stuff, more stuff through there than, than should be. This figure kind of shows you how uh, plugs and such are set up here in the United States. You go to England, it's going to be different. You've seen these type of plugs, right? Where they got a big one on one side, a smaller one on the other, and this one at the bottom where your third thing for your plug goes, right? So this is the little one's your brick ground. It goes to ground. Your small one is going to be black or red, and that's going to be your hot. That's going to be where your hot current's coming in. And your white, going to this one, is going to be neutral. Now that's on a, uh, a male, male plug. The female, just, you know, white, big. That matches with that. This matches with this. And this matches with that. Okay. So, you know, the reason we have this is so that we don't plug things in incorrectly. You don't want to ac accidentally have things reversed. Right, Rick? You can get me those. <laughs> Go back to sleep. All right, lightning protection. We were talking lightning a little bit ago, right? So lightning protection. Antennas and towers generally are not struck by lightning any more than tall trees or nearby structures. Okay, Just in general, they're not struck any more than the tall trees. But it's wise to take uh, safety precautions, take necessary steps. Lightning protection is intended to provide fire protection for your home. You don't want your antenna getting hit by lightning and all of a sudden your house going up in smoke. Okay, You want to protect it. So if our antenna not necessarily. is taller than the trees? Not necessarily, because half of lightning comes from the ground up. It's depending on the charges in the clouds and the charges in the ground. And trees have a lot better connection with the ground than your antenna probably will. With, so, with all the roots? Right. Yeah. Yep, I, I remember years ago, as a, I was a scoutmaster up at, uh, in, when we were living in Utah. And we took the scouts up to a, uh, a beautiful, beautiful Boy Scout camp that's nestled between the Tetons and Yellowstone. Beautiful country. Well, we had uh, another troop that was camping nearby. They set their tents up, and we had a lightning storm come through. And uh, the tree got hit by lightning. The electrical charge came down through the tree into the roots, and up through the tent because the young man had their tent on top of the roots. Yeah, their what? Their top tent the yeah. on top of the tree roots. And uh, two scouts are no longer with us. Okay? Freak thing, but it happens. Okay? So I have a question on that. Yeah. Is the metal of the antenna going to attract the lightning more than it would go to a tree? No, again, not, not necessarily. It, it, it's the charge in the ground and the charge in the uh, clouds that makes the light. Okay. So if your antenna is buried into the ground, then it kind of acts like a tree. But if it's 
Well, it's like most, concrete, and then there's which is not a, as good a conductor as a tree. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the way to protect those antennas from that lightning. I've had towers up for just about 50 years, never had an issue. So, now Ours that is really close said, to our house, so that's why I was wondering. Yeah. And that being said, I know people that have taken lightning strikes to towers, so it, it's certainly not impossible, right. but it's not as common as you might think. So anyway, what you do is you connections. You know, you want to make sure you're following the grounding according to the local code, building codes. Connections are made at the tower base or the rooftop through rooftop mounts through a large diameter wire to a ground rod. So what happens if it gets hit by lightning, that charge is going to come down and it's going to go into the ground. With a tower, you put a ground, you ground each of the legs of that tower and then you bond them together. And that drives that uh, electrical power into the ground. So you need a separate ground rod for each leg of the tower, even if it's in a concrete foundation? You should. It's called safety. Okay. So you absolutely have to know, but it's okay, you're right. The more ground rods you have that are interconnected, the more likely it's going to the ground instead of someplace else. Okay. Yep, you don't want it going into your house. That's, that's the key. No. So as you ground your, your equipment, you're making these ground connections. They should be as short as possible and avoid sharp bends, okay? You don't want to take and have a... tower here, right? Three-legged tower. It's all coming into the ground. What you don't want to have is you don't want to have this coming a 90 degree. You want it as short as possible and as straight as possible. You don't want sharp bends when you're grounding things. Okay. You want that current to be able to flow as quickly and easily to the ground as possible. Or like the house that I got, which had a single 16 gauge wire as a ground. It's a fusible wedge. It now has four ground rods. A lot okay. All right. So where cables and feed lines enter the house, use lightning arresters grounded to a common plate that is in turn grounded to a nearby external ground. Okay. So you want to make sure your coax coming to your house that you ground that before it comes through the through that wall. And that that's what I've done at my place. I've got three coaxes coming to to my house, and then they come through. I got to come through a PVC pipe into my into my basement. Before they come through that house, I've got a lightning arrestor on each of those coaxes and it's going to a ground. Okay. Is there a special connector you get then? You can get special coax lightning arresters that you can put right on the coax. And it's got a terminal you just connect the wire. Yep. Yep. In the, in the center you usually really come with uh, some sort of gas that when it Basically, when it heats up, it, it breaks that connection, and then it's harder to get to the wire than it takes to the path of the ground. Okay. So all ground rods need to be bonded together with heavy wire as well. You want to make sure everything's connected together as it goes into the ground. Okay. When lightning is expected, okay, we got a lightning storm coming. What should we do? The best protection is to disconnect all cables outside the house and unplug, unplug equipment power cords inside the house. That's the best safety measure you can have. Then it's isolated, right? You're not going to have that problem. Unless you're sky. Unless you're sky there you're out mobile. <laughs> or, or you're here, right? Does that mean I have to climb my tower to unhook the coax at the top of the antenna each time? Yeah. Yeah. No. No, that's when you're, <laughs> that's when you're KK would not let you do yeah. that. <laughs> no. Connect it before it comes into the house. Okay? There's, there's stories of electrical hits on a house where it comes in on a telephone line. And uh -huh. Literally blow up the phone. No. Yep. That's why we have wireless. Now. That's why we have wireless, yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> Okay. And, and I 
actually talking about the, the ham that got hit. I knew one down in, in Hutchinson, and he was a big contester there. And he had a freakish lightning storm that actually hit his antenna. Only thing left out of his antenna that he had was the uh, SO239 connector. Everything else had been blown apart and melted. Couldn't find any part of it left. But that was a one in about 100 million chance even of it. Yep. Those things happen, but they're very rare. Okay, so you're managing RF, radio frequency, in your station. Your station's close to the transmitting antenna. That's just the way it is, right? Even here, we got the uh, transmitter here. Where's the antenna? It's right here. That's close, right? It's not like we're transmitting and the antenna's a mile down the road. It's right close. So you're going to get sta the station wiring, the feed lines, the power connections, and uh, other cables all pick up RF from your transmitted signal. Feed lines and cables are connected to your equipment enclosures and the connections between them. So you got all this wire coming in, right? And you're transmitting, as transmitting signals can get on that wire. That's called RF. And the resulting current that comes across these wires and these cables is called common mode because it flows on all wires and enclosures. So it's common. So common RF, common mode RF interference is very likely. It just happens. And it's just a part of the equation of being a radio operator. So it happens, but what do we do? How do we manage that? What's going to happen if all that uh, common mode stuff, if we don't manage it? Randy, if you've got all kinds of common mode interference going on at your, your station at home, what's it going to sound like? Noise. Noise. You're not going to hear the other people on the other. You're going to hear lots of noise. And that's not what you want to hear. So it's not practical to ground this RF current in the same way that we do the AC power for, and lightning protection. The best approach is to bond all of the equipment together. Okay. So here is a schematic that shows a station that is is bonding. And what are they? What they've got here? They've got a copper pipe, and then they have their transceiver going to the copper pipe. They got their computer. They got their keyer. For those that are doing CW, an antenna switch, it's all going to this copper pipe. But when does, where does the copper pipe go from there? Ground. Goes to a ground. So these are all bonded together and they're going out to a ground. And those are all like straps, grounding straps going to that? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep, they can be, uh, the best uh, way to move this kind of ground is, is on a flat strap. That's the best. Um, but you can use, you know, wire. That'll work as well. Now, I've, I've got one of these copper pipes on the wall in my basement. So, if, uh, I don't know if my wife has noticed that. But it, I just took, got a pot, copper pipe, right? Cut it to the length that I wanted. And I put it on the wall. Then I've got my radio going to it. And my power supply. And it's going outside to the ground. Okay, that's a safety measure. Does that ever reverse or anything and create a, a, an antenna or some kind of pulling in? Everything a, is an stat, antenna. Static. Every antenna transmits. Yeah, I but I didn't understand what you said. It it possibly could, but it's it's minimal. It's minimal. You were you're not going to really see anything really from it. What you're going to see is you're going to see some good protection. Is what you're going to get. You're going to get good protection. Okay, so bond all metal equipment enclosures to a common RF ground bus or a piece of copper pipe, heavy wire, or a sheet of flashing. Use short, wide conductors such as copper flashing or strap or heavy solid 8 gauge wire or larger. Solid strap is best because it presents the lowest impedance to RF. Keep all connections and straps as short as possible and as direct as possible. 
and connect the ground bus to your AC safety ground and any earth connections for lightning protection. Just remember, grounding is making you safe. Okay? Can I ask a really stupid question? No question is stupid. Because I don't know the answer to it, but I know you're going to think this is stupid. Nope. So let's say your antenna isn't hooked. Let's say you have everything disconnected and you only connect things when you want to use your hammer. Mm -hmm. Is your antenna doing anything when it's not connected to your equipment? It, it's always receiving signals. It is? Okay. It is not affecting you. But it's not affecting you. So it's not giving off the radiation? No. No, it, no, it will not give up, exactly, it will not give off the radiations unless you're transmitting. Okay, so it only gives off when you're transmitting. Yes. You're not receiving? Correct. So if you're just listening, if you're, you're just not, listening, yeah. You're not emitting any radiation? No. Okay. okay. Yes. Solid strap? I don't even know what you're talking about. Solid strap? It's a, a solid piece of metal that's, I'll show you when we get home. Oh. Um, you know what a web belt looks like? You know, just, just sure. really like web. Like braided. A braided. It's, it's a braided belt. Like a braided flat. Yeah. It's a braided piece of, of wire, it essentially. It's like a lace necklace, like they used to wear in the 80s or the 70s, only it's metal. Yeah. Oh, you can see through it almost. Yeah. Okay. But that's, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I can, I can show you. Okay, so RFI can be in either direction, to or from the amateur radio equipment. You can get radio inter RF interference to your radio from outside sources, or your radio can be generating it, right? Interference becomes more severe with high power and closer spacing to the interference's source. So I think I just shared this example. <coughs> In fact, I know I did because my daughter came into my room yesterday when I was on one of the nets, and she says, Dad, can I use the dryer? Okay, <coughs> Because I mentioned that the dryer causes interference. She listened to me. Holy moly. <laughs> so she came and asked. And I was on UHF, VHF, wherever I was at, and it wasn't giving me any interference. So it was good. She, she could use the dryer. Rick. Good example of RFI. Once you get a radio and you got it in your vehicle, go down to Vision. Oh, they got those big electronic uh, billboards now, mm -hmm. LEDs. Listen to what they do to your radio. Mm -hmm. So a radio doesn't give off any emissions compared to them bulbs. <laughs> yep. LED bulbs in your house then. Yeah, slightly. Not, not that I'm, I'm aware of, but that's what I have in my it is smaller than Yeah, it could be small, but really not a, a major impact. It turns out a lot of stuff, though. Yep. It's the higher power stuff that, that you have in your home that's going to drive your interference. So how do you deal with this? Filters are an important part of radio. Important in preventing and eliminating RFI. They're used to prevent unwanted signals from being, radi being radiated and keeping unwanted signals from being received. Basically, all this equipment, my dryer's emitting a radio signal, right? RFI, that's what's hitting my radio, causing noise. So on wash day, I don't play with my radio. When she turned the dryer on, did it change? No, because I was on UHF, VHF, it really didn't impact it. If I was on HF, I would have a lot of noise and I wouldn't be able to hear. HF. High, High frequency. High frequency. Yep. Okay, so filters. This is just this is a schematic showing different kinds of filters. Uh, I don't have one on this computer. Okay, so here we've got a power supply or a plug coming to a phone, right? Yep. And there's a ferret core. So ferrite is a uh, material, magnetic material, that can pull in those radio signals and keep them from causing you noise. So that's what's used a lot, is ferrite in a lot of different ways. It can be used as a ferrite core. Yes, I put a lot of them in my radio shack. And, yeah. I got one on this cord, just a little one, because it's a little cord, but it's just something that just snaps on there. And I got a couple of them on here, and it 
helps to keep the noise from my laptop out of my radio. Okay, just a filter. Pulls in the, the RFI interference. Okay, and they're fairly cheap. I've got a whole Ziploc bag of them at home. And uh, so whenever I have something new, I just snap one of those on it. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Amazon is a great place for radio. Oh, you mean you can put those on any cord? Yep. They don't. They aren't part of the cord. Nope. Because I nope. think I remember seeing some cords. Yeah, some cords. Some, 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 some cords. Some, some people will have them built into the cord. Yeah. But when they're not, you can just get these and just put them on. And it eliminates that interference. Or at least it reduces. It may not eliminate it all the way, but it reduces it. Okay? So like this one, there's an AC line. It's got a ferrite core in it. And uh, it's going to the television, right? So here's a transceiver. And they got a, this is a filter. It's a low-pass transmitting filter, which helps to eliminate that, uh, that interference. So filters are a big piece. Um, you can get by without a lot of filters, but if you have filters, it helps with your transmitting and especially your receiving, what you can hear. This is a uh, example of, this is what the one looks like opened up. It's a magnetic material. Okay. It's a ceramic magnetic material. So this is what it looks like. This what this one looks like when it's open. You just run the power cord right through here, close it shut. Okay. You can also get ferrite rings like this, and then you can wrap your uh, coax right around it, and that creates you a choke or a, a filter. Okay. So just some examples of of some things that you can do. Very inexpensive. But it's a good thing to do to maintain that, uh, keep that interference out. Okay. Rick. Uh, real quick. You can't overdo it. You put too many chokes on your line, you can literally choke the line. And nothing oh. will go <laughs> yeah. It, it will reduce your power. It will reduce the voltage. Nothing that's going through that complex. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you don't want to overdo it, but... Uh, like in this case, they've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They've got nine wraps on that one. No reason though that's projected. Every loop <laughs> is a form of a filter on the large one. Yeah, essentially. You're filtering it as you're going, going through the center of the core. Okay, so most common causes of RFI from your transmissions are fundamental overload, harmonics, and spurious emissions. Each has a different effect and is eliminated differently. So fundamental overload must be fundamental. Very strong sim signals may overwhelm a receiver's ability to reject them, and this is what's known as fundamental overload. So you've got strong signals, and they're overwhelming your, your transceiver. Okay. And so all of a sudden you're getting pfft, noise because you're getting too much signal coming through. We have a problem right now with this radio on here. We think coming from the transformers just in the corner of the property. But this uh, receiver, it'll actually go to an overload mode. It's got a little OV, I think it's OVD up in the corner that starts to flash red. And the S meter is up S9 almost 20 over sometimes, so all you hear is noise. But it's overloading the front end of the computer. Yeah. Is there any way that you, well, never mind. Yeah, we, we've, we've called the uh, power company. They're coming out and te doing some testing. I'm supposed to fix that. I'm supposed to. Yeah. Okay, so consumer equipment is often unable to reject strong signals outside of the bands it is intended to serve, for instance, TV, AM, and FM receivers. So if I'm transmitting and uh, my daughter's watching a TV show on, uh, on our roof antenna, there could definitely be some interference because it, it's, the equipment just can't filter that out. A high-pass filter can be connected to a, the antenna input of FM and TV receivers to reject these strong lower frequency signals from amateur HF signals. A band reject 
or notch filter can be used to reduce interference from amateur VHF and UHF signals. And uh, broadcast reject filters attenuate signals from nearby AM and FM TV broadcasts. So you, you got all these signals, radio waves coming through. These filters, they help to take that noise out. And then you're able to listen to the signals that, that you want to listen to, that you, that you got your license for. Harmonics, spurious emissions, and leakage. So there are minor imperfections in every transmitter, okay? There's minor things. And you end up with RF output signal that contains weak harmonics of the desired output signal. Remember when we talked about harmonics? We had the wave, right? And we had one that comes just a little bit different. That's what the harmonics is. It's just a little bit off. And that's what can happen with, you know, a transmitter. They can also contain other spurious emissions that cause interference to nearby equipment. So I can, as I'm transmitting, I can get a spurious thing out and all of a sudden the microwave starts operating. You don't want that to happen. Okay. But uh, <coughs> to prevent these types of uh, transmissions, harmonics and spurious transmissions from being radiated from your station, a low pass or a band pass filter might be installed at the transmitter's connection to the antenna feed line, as we saw back here on this bottom one. They got a low pass filter in there. I have to unplug my uh, Mac computer when I'm transmitting, otherwise it's cycling on and on. Yep. So uh, you can also get interference from other radios. Um, yeah. So if you're transmitting, like we go out to parks on the air and we, we're all transmitting, we've got our radios close together, right? Randy might be 100 feet that way, Rick might be 100 feet that way, Bruce might be 100 feet the other way, and, uh, you know, Randy might be broadcast, transmitting up at, a, at 100 watts, and I'm trying to, to transmit, and all of a sudden Randy transmits, and I, well, all I hear is <laughs> RFI coming from Randy's radio. And I hear real quickly, Randy, how much power are you running? <laughs> Been there, we've all done it. We've all done it. <laughs> exactly. So what about different types of antennas all in the same place? Do they interfere? Kind of like, okay, so we have our TV antenna on the same tower as our ham radio antenna. Are they going to... They can. Interfere with each other? So maybe we won't get the proper... Yes, but TV. not as much as you might think. Yeah. It's, it's an inspected... That should be... That should be an, not and. An inspected and approved climbing harness, work boots to protect the arches of your feet. You want to make sure that this is critical, that it's approved, and that it's inspected. You don't want to go up with a harness and all of a sudden you're at the top and, uh-oh, I'm, I'm coming down. Not the way I wanted to. So you want to make sure you're safe. And that's, that's it. So... Any questions on what we've covered tonight? I know we covered a lot in a short period of time. Was there a, was there a handout? Yes, yes. You betcha. <laughs>